Hello everyone and welcome back to another episode here at the Damage Report. Still under lockdown following the first day of the DNC, which was an event, sort of. We're gonna get into it. Who's we? It's me, but also a new face for you on today. Yasmin Aliyah Khan, political commentator and video blogger joins us for the first time. Yasmin, how's it going? Going really, really good, how are you? Uh, I'm good and I'm glad to have you here. I'm excited to talk uh, the DNC with you. Mm -hmm. We're gonna get into that. We're gonna talk about you know whether there's gonna be an election and what it's gonna look like, the coronavirus and and all of that. What about you? How's, how's the political week going so, uh, for you so same. far? A lot of the same, a lot of you know distress and then finding hope somewhere and then just hope you know continuing on with life. From yeah. So um, I gave you a little bit of an intro there, but um, I know some people might be familiar with you from your appearances on The Common Room on uh, TYT's Twitch channel. Mm -hmm. But for those who might be seeing you for the first time, tell us a little bit about your work. I am a video blogger. I make videos that kind of explain really complex things that you may have seen in the news, but you're not really sure how it all fits into your real life, how it affects American politics, how it affects international politics. Um, just kind of giving you the history of how we got to where we are today and what it means going forward. And awesome. in a way that's easy to understand, it's a little bit palatable. Exactly, and I think I mentioned on the common room, one of the things that's really impressive about your work is that you, you try to broach um, topics that, that tend towards people having very incendiary uh, views on, like people like to fight it out on them, but you try to you try to explain things in a level-headed way, you know, and, and and I respect that. These are complicated topics that you, you, you dump into. Yeah, yeah I, I try to. So. I think that, that's all you can do. Um, I don't even try. So um, also, we're going to be talking about one of those topics later on in the show when we talk about Israel, the UAE, Jerusalem, oh. um, and all of that. Mm -hmm. um, by the way, for everyone who is uh, currently watching this show, please feel free to hit the like button and you can share the stream. Let more people know that the show is active. We're gonna be responding throughout to your comments and twitches and tweets and all of that, super chats as well. Um, by the way, we're already getting some comments, um, Yasmin. One commenter asks the first thing, this is what they always ask any new guests on the show, do you have any pets? No, I don't. But right now, there's a bird that's trapped in the garage, and he won't leave. So maybe oh. does count. <laughs> you didn't trap him. He no, trapped himself, no, no, no. basically. He just found his way into the garage, and that's where he lives now. We, I've tried. I've left okay. the garage door open so he can leave, and he's just. This is my new home. So I guess it. technically, yeah. I have a pet. When I was a kid, I had a turtle, and my brother let that's it go. Cool. And, oh, you know Beardsley Park. Um, yeah, of course, Beardsley Park. Connecticut. Okay, yeah. so my brother let the turtle go in the lake at Garrity Park. Oh. So that was the last. No, I think. I think my father might have gotten us some turtles from Beardsley Park. Actually, I'm sure it came from Beardsley Park, and then my brother <laughs> went to get back. But it's the circle of is, life. Yeah, my <laughs> house is right across the street from Beardsley Park, so we used to just walk over there all the time. Awesome. Yeah. Um, okay, well, so we have a tradition on the show where when we hit a thousand likes, that means at the end of the show, generally we will show one of our pets. So that's gonna be difficult to do, but if the bird happens to fly into the room you're recording from, feel yeah. free to point the camera at it. And yeah. um, yes, uh, okay, so we're going to launch into our topics. We've got a lot that we're gonna be getting to, and unfortunately not in the form I wanted to get to it, but hey, what are you gonna do? Why don't we start talking about the DNC? So last night we had the first night of the DNC, or at least what passes for the DNC or for indeed any event in 2020. Um, it was generally a pre-recorded speeches, a few live ones, some commercials and music videos and things like that. Um, I, I've got a few highlights that I wanna talk about, but yes, but I'm curious overall, did it meet your expectations? Did it exceed or fall below your Um, no, if I really had expectations going in, I didn't put a whole lot of thought into what was going to be happening, but I think I just didn't care either. And that being said, I, yeah, it probably meant whatever I was expecting to see. There was a lot of just platitudes and a lot of Joe's a good guy, which is cool. Um, it felt more <laughs> like a campaign rally for Joe, um, which is fine. You know, I'm sure we're going to talk about Bernie later and Michelle Obama, but, um, Everyone else is pretty forgettable, I would have said. Yeah, um, did you have high hopes for a Kasich speech? 
why is he there? <laughs> like, I, I, like the the Democrats keep propping up Kasich like he's this hero of the right who saw the light and came over to the left, you know. But he's not that. And mm-hmm. the reality is, it's more dangerous. I think that the Democrats are pandering to this former or current Republican. I don't even know what he is anymore. Yeah. Um, and um, I didn't like what he had to say. You know, I didn't like his insinuation that Joe is not going to become more progressive once he gets into office. I didn't like it just felt very um, presumptuous and almost entitled. You know, mm-hmm. I think or you were talking about it in your wrap up. It's it's not a good sign going forward. And he doesn't have that level of Republican support that he can start pandering to that demographic at this point. Yeah, or that, I mean, he might, but he shouldn't. But like so that you can get a, a percentage yeah. point of the vote. Yeah. What's the point it's, of that? And and it felt almost like almost like a threat kind of. I know that that's sort of what Jenk said last night, but it's like, yeah. no, he's not going to turn hard left. He better not or else he'll lose it what the bit of the Republican like Party that supports Kasich. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It felt it felt weird and he was like out in a field or something. I don't even know where he was. It looked like he Did was on put a- up that picture. Yeah. Oh yeah, the picture was on Twitter and I think um oh, it was Brett Ehrlich. He posted it. Yeah. On Instagram, it's it weird. Bizarre. Yeah, and why did he stand right there, like at the apex of wherever he stand? I don't know. It's very yeah. Bizarre. It reminds me of like the scene near the end of Castaway, where Tom Hanks is like standing in the middle of nowhere, wondering which way his life is gonna go. But that was a meaningful moment because we had been there with Tom Hanks through his struggle and yeah. and coming to grips with things. Kasich's struggle has been to take away women's ability to exercise, you know, the freedom and choice over their own bodies, to destroy unions, and provide tax cuts to the wealthy. Basically, everything that Donald Trump wants to do, but mm-hmm. he doesn't like Trump while he wants to do it. I don't know. I don't think Kasich has ever really segued away from his Republican roots, at least not as much as he likes to pretend he has, especially now that he's a guest at the DNC. So he doesn't like Trump and that's about it. It's like what you said, that's where it ends for that. You know, it's not like he's for democratic policies necessarily or progressive policies that are not at all, you know? Yeah. Yeah, it's just oh god, so frustrating. Okay. Um there were there were some parts that I thought were pretty pretty effective. So there was um let's see, we had uh, Kristen Urquiza. She is one of the many Americans that has tragically lost a family member uh, due to the pandemic. She lost her father. And I would love to play some of the video for you, but unfortunately we can't. So she said that her father trusted Trump as so many have, including perhaps Herman Cain most notably. And she said that her father had a pre-existing condition and it was trusting the wrong person and he died after a struggle with coronavirus. I think it's gonna be an interesting question to see how much they really focus on the pandemic. I imagine they're going to quite a bit, but this was a, I think a pretty effective first volley if that is going to be a focus for the DNC. Yeah, I thought that of a lot of the speakers that were there, the, the real people speakers, that one did stand out to me as well. Um, I, I think there is a video for it, but. Um, oh, yeah. we're, just, we're just having some idiot. Uh, vis- uh, it, yeah, some oh, we do, we do? Okay, you noticed that I didn't. Okay, let's do it, let's go to the video. <laughs> I'm Kristen Urquiza. I'm one of the many who has lost a loved one to COVID. My dad, Mark Anthony Urquiza, should be here today, but he isn't. He had faith in Donald Trump. He voted for him, listened to him, believed him and his mouthpieces when they said that coronavirus was under control and going to disappear, that it was okay to end social distancing rules before it was safe, and that if you had no underlying health conditions, you'd probably be fine. So in late May, after the stay-at-home order was lifted in Arizona, My dad went to a karaoke bar with his friends. A few weeks later, he was put on a ventilator. And after five agonizing days, he died alone in the ICU with a nurse holding his hand. My dad was a healthy 65-year-old. His only pre-existing condition was trusting Donald Trump. And for that, he paid with his life. And it is is very sad. I mean, if you know someone who is who has died? Like I, I had, um, you know, a, a close family member that, that passed away in a similar sort of situation. I think that that is ve- that's going to be quite effective. The question will be how many people are watching any of this because this is 
like I, you know, I, I was at the last two conventions. Those were big, like impressive things. These just feel so shrunken down and shriveled by comparison for a number of different reasons. Um, yeah, so we'll we'll see how many people actually tune in. Yeah, I mean, I barely I had it on and I was I was watching, but even then, it was really hard for me to stay focused and engage for a lot of it. And I mean, I do this all the time and the production value was good. I'll say that <laughs> it seemed like they worked really hard on what they did. But um, besides that, wasn't super impressed or it yeah. just didn't feel necessary. And I think I saw somewhere on Twitter that they were talking about, you know, is a convention like this even necessary at this point? And more I was like, well, I don't think so. You know, <laughs> like we're all on Twitter. I think back in like maybe the 90s, it had more of an appeal and more of a purpose. But now yeah. everybody's on Twitter, everybody gets the news all the time anyway. And the people who are engaged in that sphere, they're also the same ones who are watching the DNC. So I would imagine. Yeah. I mean, look, if it could be, if we didn't have the pandemic, if you could have a big actual convention with big speeches and stuff like that, I think there is some value to that. Yeah. Uh, the question will be, how much do we get that approaches that? I thought. Bernie Sanders speech, which I'm gonna read a little bit from, was good. Michelle Obama, while not you know focused on the substance like uh, Bernie was, was, was effective in terms of, I think, communicating. And I think it was very well received. Mm -hmm. But like, we don't need three or three more nights of Amy Klobuchar's mom jokes and Kasich standing in a field. Eva Longoria was good. Like, yeah, I, could, I could go fine. for more of that. Yeah, she was fine. She uh, was I think Michelle was, yeah, and she's very effective, I think. I mean, I like her. You know, I know she's not as progressive as we would like her to be, or maybe she is. I don't know. But mm -hmm. I think that a lot of what she said went beyond a lot of the platitudes and the nonsense that we had been hearing the whole rest of the night for what, an hour and a half prior to that, you know? And I think what she said needed to be said, and people wanted her to say it. They wanted to hear. You know, and it's really hard to argue that anything she said was bad. You know, who's going to say that being morally just and being a good person and not voting for Trump that those are bad things? You know, but at the same time, people need to hear it and they want to hear it and they want to be reassured that there's somebody out there who has hope in the whole process. Yeah. And then I like that she closed it with that. I thought she did a good job of closing it that way. And I like that she also came after Bernie. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Um, and, and she had an actual like legit speech. Yeah. Bernie had a chunk of a speech. Everyone else had a campaign ad, and that was it. And and the yeah. one funny thing, and I'll have more to say about Michelle in just a moment. But the one interesting thing was I've been stewing in rage over the decision to give AOC just sixty seconds for the last week. Yeah. And now, like after watching the first half of the first night, I was like. Oh, okay. 60 seconds is about what everyone's getting if they're lucky. Maybe this isn't so bad actually. I had the same the same feeling. I was watching it and I was like, oh, all these people, they're just like boom, boom, boom. Because when you hear 60 seconds, you know, what can possibly be said in 60 seconds? Nothing, you know? Yeah. But now, now I get it. It makes sense now. We need to talk about a relatively new show called Un the Republic or UNFTR. As a Young Turks fan, you already know that the government, the media, and corporations are constantly peddling lies that serve the interests of the rich and powerful. But now there's a podcast dedicated to unraveling those lies, debunking the conventional wisdom. In each episode of Un the Republic, or UNFTR, the host delves into a different historical episode or topic that's generally misunderstood or purposely obfuscated by the so-called powers that be, featuring in-depth research, razor sharp commentary and just the right amount of vulgarity the unftr podcast takes a sledgehammer to what you thought you knew about some of the nation's most sacred historical cows but don't just take my word for it the new york times described unftr as consistently compelling and educational aiming to challenge conventional wisdom and upend the historical narratives that were taught in school for as the great philosopher yoda once put it you must unlearn what you have learned. And that's true whether you're in Jedi training or you're uprooting and exposing all the propaganda and disinformation you've been fed over the course of your lifetime. So search for UNFDR in your podcast app today and get ready to get informed, angered, and entertained all at the same time. Joe supports raising the minimum wage to $15 an hour. 
This will give 40 million workers a pay raise and push the wage scale up for everyone else. Joe will also make it easier for workers to join unions, create 12 weeks of paid family leave, fund universal pre-K for three and four year olds, and make childcare affordable for millions of families. Joe will rebuild our crumbling infrastructure and fight the threat of climate change by transitioning us to 100% clean electricity over the next 15 years. These initiatives will create millions of good paying jobs all across our country. As you know, we are the only industrialized nation not to guarantee health care for all people. While Joe and I disagree on the best path to get universal coverage, he has a plan that will greatly expand health care and cut the cost of prescription drugs. Further, he will lower the eligibility age of Medicare from 65 down to 60. To help reform our broken criminal justice system, Joe will end private prisons and detention centers, cash bail, and the school-to-prison pipeline. So let's talk uh, about the substance, though. Um, while many of the speakers at the first night of the DNC were focused on uh, Trump is bad for a number of reasons, which I mostly agree with, but I've heard it a million times, or right. Joe's a good guy, which seems to be true. He has empathy and compassion and all of that, but I would like to see it attached to policy. Uh, Bernie Sanders, well, he gave a bit of that. And his mission that night was to try to get more progressives to be comfortable with the idea of, uh, of supporting Joe Biden. Right. The way that he went about it, he tried to do what he always does, which is to ground it in an acknowledgement of our problems, what needs to be done to fix them, and what Joe Biden is actually supporting to potentially do that. So I wanna read you just a, a little tiny bit. So um, he says, uh, let me offer you just a few examples of how Joe will move us forward. Uh, Joe supports raising the minimum wage to $15 an hour. He acknowledges that'll give 40 million workers a pay raise. He wants to make it easier for workers to join unions, create 12 weeks of paid family leave, fund universal pre-K for three and four year olds, make childcare affordable for millions of families. Um, rebuild our crumbling infrastructure, fight the threat of climate change by transitioning us to 100% clean electricity over the next 15 years. Um, that will create millions of good paying jobs. He says that they disagree on the best path to universal health care coverage, but he has a plan that will greatly expand health care and cut the cost of prescription drugs, while also lowering the eligibility age of Medicare from 65 to 60. And he talks about him ending cash bail, ending private prisons and detention centers, and the school to prison pipeline. That little summary I just gave there from his speech was more acknowledgement of what can actually be done to solve problems in terms of policy than I believe, and I don't think I'm being too unfair, the entire rest of the night. Yes, Ben, is that, am I being fair or unfair in I saying I think that? that's fair. You know, it was funny because in your after show, Jenk asked you if you rem could remember anything that Klobuchar had said, and you were like, I don't know. And honestly, what did she say? I remember that weird joke that she made. Well, now I don't even remember the joke she made. But yeah, something, oh, about the mail. Like, oh, you'll have to do a change of address or something like that. That's what we were getting the whole night was a bunch of those, you know? And then stories, personal stories, whatever. But nobody talked about policy and how you know the changes that they want are actually going to make it to the people. Bernie was the only one, and this he was an hour and a half in who did that. You know what else he did that I really, really enjoyed was that he addressed his millions of people who supported him during the primaries, which to me felt a little bit like a flex on Bernie's part. Like, yeah, I got a million people, but it was also a really um, Good reminder, I think, to the Democrats that there are millions of Americans who generally vote Democratic who supported these really, really progressive ideals, you know, and even really, really progressive as far as the Democrats would see them, right? Mm -hmm. And I think it's important that he keeps reminding people of that because it's true. I mean, there's so much buy-in and support for all these these platforms. You know, Medicare for all, overwhelmingly Americans support that idea. So it's not unreasonable to expect your government to deliver that for you if they can and they can. So. Yeah, yeah, I, I would argue that that sort of expectation is the whole point of having a democracy in the first place. We should be able to expect those right. sorts of things. Yeah, and um, especially with Kasich's comment, I think it was kind of like a nice, oh, no, we're still gonna be a little bit more progressive. We're still gonna go a little further left. Yeah. 
so I think that Bernie did a good job of doing what his mission there was, which mm -hmm. was to try to press the party on the issues he cares about while pressing his supporters to support Joe Biden, which mm -hmm. I know Bernie's gonna get a lot of criticism for that, even from some people who supported him in the past, even though like you can't look at anything Bernie has done through the course of his career and find what he's doing right now to be inconsistent with that. Yeah. He has always supported vigorous primary challenges, trying to expand the scope of the conversation politically, and then pragmatic political moves that have the best chance of delivering that outcome. In mm -hmm. the same way that he supported Hillary Clinton in 2016, he's supporting Joe Biden this year. He would prefer it was him, I would prefer it was him, I'm sure a lot of people would. But that's not the situation we're in right now, and so he's proceeding accordingly. You know, it, it kind of reminds me whenever I find people who voted for Trump back in 2016, and then they're disgruntled about everything he's done ever since then. It's like, well, what did you expect? And they're like, oh, well, I figured he would change once he got into office. I figured he would be a little less crazy once he got into office. I was like, why? I mean, he's always been that person, you know, and this is what he's been consistent with even before he was running for president. So now I'm kind of. Um, hesitant to say that Democrats or, or progressives are thinking the same thing will happen with Joe Biden. But I think the big difference there, the big distinction is that Joe Biden is already further left than Donald Trump is. And Bernie's message wasn't that Joe Biden will change and be more like us. It's still that we're gonna have to work for these policies, but we just have a much better chance of pushing them through with Joe Biden there as opposed to Donald Trump. I think exactly. That, you know, we gotta remember that. Yeah, there's no path where the next four years are fun and awesome and easy. It's just not gonna happen. The question is, what do you want that fight to look like? How difficult do you want it to be? Mm -hmm. You can have it impossible or you can have it very difficult and annoying and frustrating and depressing. Yeah, um, especially when you consider just a democratic cabinet would be amazing. You know, even having a full cabinet would be amazing. Mm -hmm. You know, just getting things done all over in different aspects of government. That's what needs to happen. That's what hasn't been happening this whole yeah. time for almost four years now. Um, but I did want to read a comment. Um, so I got a statement from um, Josie Caballero. She was a candidate who was on the show several times, is now a delegate who is planning to vote for Bernie at the DNC. Josie gave us this statement saying, the convention has begun to the same empty platitudes we saw back in 2016. The mm -hmm. DNC seems to think that pretty images and right wing conservatives speaking for another centrist Democrat will inspire a nation to vote. Well, canned clapping and cheering will not convince anyone. Um, and, and, and I agree, I don't know. I don't know how effective it's going to be in, in rallying some conservatives to support him. But I think that if that is their strategy, and I wish that that wasn't, I wish that they were inspiring more um, younger, disaffected, and apathetic progressives and leftists and all of that to get involved. But if they are going to go for those conservatives, I mean, focusing on how Trump is crazy and Joe Biden's a decent guy, that's a way to do it, I guess. It's I don't, I, just, I don't think it's gonna be effective either as far as converting people. I think that it's only good for the people who are already going to vote for Joe Biden. And even then they're just like, yeah, this is fine. They're not particularly riled up about it, you know, or excited to go vote. But as far as the Republicans, if they're even tuning into something like this, I mean, we've been criticizing Donald Trump for how long? Since before he was elected and hasn't done anything. That's not the messaging that they're looking for, you know? All they do is say, oh, Democrats, oh, progressives, and then they kind of brush it off. And even if you have all the data to back up whatever you're saying, they don't care. <laughs> they don't listen to it, you know? I think the only thing that I've found that people really will vote for or against something is if it impacts their wallet, their bank account. Yeah. Uh, or if some or if they've been very, very specifically and directly affected by something. Like if somebody they know died of COVID. Yeah. But beyond that, I don't this isn't gonna do it. You know, uh, you, you mentioned COVID. That that'll transition to one of the last things I want to say about this is uh, one of the the aspects of Michelle Obama's speech that um, I think was effective and certainly was effective in uh, angering Donald Trump was when she said that he was in over his head. He's yeah. you know a failure on these policies, including responding to the pandemic, and that he's not going to change. Like it's not like becoming president just like it makes you into a different person or you really change all that much. Like it reveals who you actually are, especially during a crisis. And clearly she said with 150,000 people having already died in America from this, um, he is a failure in that regard. So uh, many people liked her remarks. Trump was asked about it this morning and here is some of what he had to say about Michelle Obama's speech. 
Yeah, no, she was over her head, and frankly, she should have made the speech live, which she didn't do. She taped it, and it was not only taped, it was taped a long time ago because she had the wrong deaths. She didn't even mention the vice presidential candidate uh, in the speech, and, you know, she gets these fawning reviews. If you gave a real review, it wouldn't be so fawning. Okay, so yeah, she was over her head. So the funny thing about that, of course, is look, of course he's not gonna like Michelle Obama's speech until Melania gives a different version of it, then he might like it. Um, but anyway, it was like she had the deaths wrong. She said 150,000, what did she record that a week ago? There's like 20,000 more people died, you dummy, you idiot, get it right. I killed way more people, what an idiot, what a moron that you think that that owns her. That's I not how it works. I understand sometimes, and I really try to understand where he's coming from and how he thinks that these things are going to play out. Like I saw on Twitter this morning, um, <clears throat> Michelle Obama was trending, and they were talking about her speech and how she was trying to take this moral high ground. But really, here's a video from her from what was it like seven years ago or something, praising Harvey Weinstein. And I was like, why would you even bring this up? Because first of all, this was before all the allegations had come out about him. But then on top of that, like there's pictures of your president with her, with um, uh, Epstein. Yeah. You know, like he's not any better. Even if Michelle Obama says something nice about Weinstein, it doesn't negate everything that Trump has said about similar figures. You know, and and he's even now, like he was, up until recently, he was talking positively about Maxwell, you know? Yeah. So I don't know how much foresight they put into any of these arguments that they make. Seems like yeah, not. Exactly. A lot. It's, so. yeah, it's, it's a weird one. And, and like when he, when he makes that point, isn't he at least inspiring his fans to look up what the death count is? But I know that they don't, they don't believe that that's true either. They think that she was wrong, but they also don't like, God knows what the average Trump fan thinks the actual death count is or whether it matters. Um, they don't believe it, you know. They really don't, it's, it's frustrating. One of the most exciting things to watch through this election is, is Trump gonna accept the results? And um, we honestly won't know until the end, but let's exhaust ourselves and stress ourselves out by checking in on the current state of it. So here he is in Wisconsin at one of his rallies talking about the only way he can lose this election. So we have to win the election. We can't play games, get out and vote, do those uh, beautiful absentee ballots, or just make sure your vote gets counted. Make sure, because the only way we're gonna lose this election is if the election is rigged, remember that. It's the only way we're gonna lose this election. So we have to be very careful. Now look, we have, this is more than this election. That's a big statement. The only way they're gonna win is that way, and we can't let that happen. Okay, so that multiple times there he said the only way they can lose. That was not all of the times in that speech. That was just one section. He said it at other points as well. So um, that's the only way, is that? Yasmin, is that like political hyperbole, I'm so confident? Or do you think that that is setting his audience up to believe that Biden winning by its very nature cannot be legitimate? 100% the latter. It harkens back, I think, also to back when he was on the campaign trail back in 2015. And he kept saying, I'm the only one who can fix all these problems. It's only me. And this kind of rhetoric, this verbiage that he's choosing to use is very deliberate. You know, it is kind of like, um, I don't want to say brainwashing, but yeah, it is hyperbolic. And it is a, a form, maybe a mild form of it, but it's still a form of fear mongering. You know, if this happens, it's because of this. And you, and it, it's almost like he's priming his audience to be angry before there's anything to be angry about. It's almost like if you tell someone this is what's going to happen and then it happens and they believe everything else that you said, all the other reasons why that they've already given you. It's like, oh, well, he already said it, you know, so he must yeah. be. He must be onto something. He must know something that we don't. Trump doesn't know anything. Okay. <laughs> nothing. He doesn't know anything you know or don't know. He knows absolutely <laughs> nothing. Um, yeah. And and just ask yourself, if he continually says the only way I can lose is if it's rigged, does that strike you as the position of a person who is confident that they will win? No. And mm. I think that's also the more puzzling part of everything as far as his uh, his supporters, he still hang on all of his words. It's like, how do you reconcile these two things? This man who thinks that he deserves a presidency, who thinks that he 
can't be beat from the presidency, but also at the same time is sabotaging the USPS and then is doing all these other things to ensure that he wins the election. But of course, if he wins by rigging, it's it's not rigging. Yeah, it's only if and Joe Biden does. Yeah, and so two other comments that he gave that I'm not gonna subject you to the video of, but I wanted to at least mention was one, um, the joke that he tells, which is we're gonna win four more years and then we're gonna get four more years because they spied on my campaign. So we get a redo on four years. No, oh my he's, God. He's just joking though. You know, it's a funny joke from a guy who locks people up and you know bombs yeah. people and tells his supporters to you know viciously maul protesters. Is this a joke about being an authoritarian I think ruler, Trump's buddy? Funny guy. You probably just don't get a sense of humor, John. It's, it's probably too dumb. So nuance to his humor. You know, you got to yeah. be really, really smart to get it. So. I think you're right. I got to stop being so triggered by his, <laughs> his very funny comedy. Um, okay, anyway, yeah, and then the other thing. Says what is on his mind all the time. He makes a lot of jokes. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, I, the funniest thing I think from the video we showed you was uh, absentee ballots are okay. Beautiful absentee ballots, those are okay. No, but that's like he he will. It's like 1984. He will have a crowd saying no mail-in ballots. Yes, absentee ballots. No mail-in ballots. Like, and it, and it works. They believe it, they have that amount of mental flexibility and no more to believe that those two things are simultaneously true. And the question is going to be, it's or the interesting thing to see will be how many of his followers will do those things, because they're the same thing. Will they trust it or will they not? Because he's giving them vastly different messages depending on the second. If I was a Trump supporter, I would be very confused all the time. <laughs> we, like I, I wouldn't know how to act, I wouldn't know what to believe. And that's if I only listened to the things that Trump said himself, to only the things that came out of his own mouth. And it's, it is weird because some people, they will just waffle back and forth. And I saw on Twitter one day, somebody said, you know, if Trump's saying to wear a mask, we should do it for him because he has done so much for us. And it was like, well, what? So they really <laughs> will kind of do all these things just because he said so. And that's the extent of their thought process in that regard. Yeah. It's the team at least. I, I hate the impulse behind that, but honestly, I just want to be able to resume my life. So sure, wear a mask because Trump has done so much for us. Whatever, I just wear if, a mask. If that gets you to do it, then fine. But then the the trouble is that like the next day, he's like, you don't need to if you don't want to. You know, like he changes his mind and then he negates the things that he said because he was in a bad mood that day or whatever. You know. Yeah. They they're selling Trump 2020 masks on his website while he and all of his supporters say that masks are a like socialist plot to destroy the constitution. He's selling That's them. Amazing. That's anyway. amazing. Yeah. Okay. So in response to the video we just showed you, let, let's turn to another aspect of this. Uh, Chris Wallace, one of the last Republicans on Fox News who's willing to question Donald Trump. The rest are in lockstep with him. Mm -hmm. um, they're afraid of being called fake news, which in fact earlier this week he did call them fake news. Right. So here he is talking about Trump's talk about how the only way he can lose is if it's rigged. Uh, I, look. The president obviously is going to make the case for himself and make the case against Joe Biden. But this is troubling. And he did it in my interview with him, I guess, three weeks ago. He's done it repeatedly before and since. The argument that if he loses, it's because the election was stolen from him, not because a majority of Americans voted against him. Uh, you know, obviously, one of the things that we treasure in this country is the peaceful transition of power. Not saying that Joe, that Joe Biden's going to win and Donald Trump's going to lose. But if that should happen, and there's certainly a possibility that it will, one would hope that whoever wins, whoever loses, that both sides will agree that was the judgment of the American people and they're going to abide by it. So yes, but I want to ask you a question. I've, I've debated with several different people on the show over the course of the past month or so. Based on everything that you've seen and what you understand about American politics, um, the fears that I guess even implicit in this segment I'm expressing about how the election is going to go, how the you know, the days or week after the election are going to go, are we going to have a smooth transfer of power? Do you share those fears, or do you think that in the end we'll have an election pretty much like any other election? No, we're not going to have an election just like every other election. It's already not that. And I think I've been saying this for a while that Trump will not go quietly if he is not elected in November. 
I've been saying it for a long time and people I think think that I'm hyperbolic or overreacting whenever I say things like that. But I was like, why? I mean, I don't have any inside information here. I'm just going off of what he said. You know, he's it, it's all there. You know, if he loses the election, it was rigged, right? Um, he's already sabotaging the USPS to enable this. He doesn't deny that Russia has been helping him. Uh, he says all kinds of things like, um, what did he say the other day? Oh yeah, all of his jokes about the election. He was saying that uh, I'll only leave if I agree with the results. What does that even mean? <laughs> like he's already disagreeing with the, you know, projected results. You mm-hmm. know, he's not going anywhere. He makes jokes about staying longer, which he's done in the past before. Like this isn't the first time that he's alluded to serving longer than eight years as the president. So no, I don't think it's gonna go easy. It's already not easy. He's already doing all these things to kind of dismantle the system. And then any checks and balances that we would have had on that is not gonna is not in place either, or not mm-hmm. to the point that I'm confident in them. Congress hasn't done anything to stop him this far. I don't expect them to start in November. And then also the military and the police, all these things, it's it's just not lining up well. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, in in terms of the oversight, we've got they're going to bring DeJoy and some other post office officials in. Is that going to accomplish much? I, yesterday, Francesca and I talked about it, and we we don't have high expectations for that. I don't know. I guess we'll see. I want to be surprised. Yeah, I'd love to be there. You know, there, there's all these things that happen, and it sounds good, but at the end of the day, what's going to happen? It's the same Congress that we're working with. It's the same president that we're working with. We already know what their goals and their motives are. We already know what they are not willing to do and what they are willing to do as far as basically just sucking up to this president (laughs) for the sake of having a Republican president. So I'm not optimistic going forward. Well, um, so Chris Wallace there, you had uh, pushing back a little bit against the president's rhetoric. It's a moment perhaps for conservatives on Fox News to sort of soberly reflect on um, the way Trump has talked about this. Is this actually how we want an incumbent president to be talking about the election? And so this morning, we have a, a new tone, a totally changed tone from Donald Trump. Here he is talking about the election. The Democrats want to make it a political issue. It's not a political issue. It's really about a correct vote. You have to get voting voting right. You can't have millions and millions of ballots sent all over the place, sent to people that are dead, sent to dogs, cats, sent everywhere. This is a serious situation. This isn't games, and you have to get it right. I just want to get it right. Win, lose, or draw. I think we're going to win. Win, lose, or draw, we have to get it right. You can't take millions of ballots, send them haphazardly all over the country or all all over a state, and expect to come out properly. And if you look at the last 10 elections where they did this universal, and by the way, absentee is great. It's been working for a long time, like in Florida. Absentee, you request, and it comes in, and then you send it back. Absentee is great. But universal is going to be a disaster, the likes of which our country has never seen. It'll end up being a rigged election or they will never come out with an outcome. They'll have to do it again. And nobody wants that, and I don't want that. Okay, so uh, again, absentee is okay, because there you have to request the ballot and then send it in. Mail-in ballot isn't okay, because he falsely believes that they just send out millions of ballots to anybody, no matter who, whether they're a human or a cat or a dog. None of that is true. It's Where the same exact process. Get this stuff from I like I don't know about you, but my bird in the garage doesn't have a mailing address. <laughs> you know, like like it's unbelievable. I it's, think its address is your garage now. I guess <laughs> it's probably it. I should register him, right? But it's he just keeps repeating the same things over and over again, which is kind of it's like an authoritarian tactic almost. Just to keep repeating things, whether or not you have any basis for them, whether or not they're grounded in anything any kind of reality or fact or figures. But the more you say it, the more ingrained it becomes in people's minds. And then next thing you know, they start repeating it and then it becomes a whole thing. So there's no evidence that anyone's dog is getting an absentee ballot in the mail, but people will believe it now. Now that it's just come out of his mouth, now it's a thing. He yeah. wished it into existence. And and the thing that I'm worried about is I, I, it like kills me to listen to these videos and then play them. But we have to know what messaging is going out to his fans. And so yeah. the idea that it's likely to be rigged, he's been saying that now, that's a standard line. The idea that it might take 
days or weeks or months or years to know who won, which again isn't true. That's a standard line. But now he's mixed in, they might have to do it again. We might need a do over election, which nobody believes it's not true. But that's an additional thing that his fans are gonna start talking about. That the Dems are setting up where you know we might not be able to trust the first result. Maybe we gotta do a second election. It's not gonna happen, but it is leading millions of Americans to have insane expectations about how the first couple of weeks of November are likely to go. And if you can get them to believe those sorts of things, you can get them to accept happily the Supreme Court stepping in and shutting down the counting of mail-in voting and, and all of that. Yeah, I mean, that's kind of my point from earlier is, you know, all these things, he's lining them up very deliberately, very specifically, so that come November, come January, he has the buy in that he needs already. It's already been there. He's already had people buy in since, you know, since 2016 almost. Yeah. People are willing to believe whatever he tells them. He is the only source that they need. If nobody else confirms it, it's because they're all, you know, paid out or they're the, mainstream media and you can't trust them anyway, or it's fake news, whatever it is. I mean, the whole fake news thing in and of itself was brilliant because he just immediately from the beginning discredited anything that any of the major news networks had to say. So anyone who denies him or criticizes him, easy, fake news. It's just like a really easy, you don't have to think about it. You don't have to apply a whole lot of mental thought or you know introspection even. You just say, oh, fake news, easy. Yeah, it's been convenient. Mm -hmm. um, it, all, all the average American wants, most humans, but especially Americans, is a reason to not have to think about things that make them their brains hurt. Like mm -hmm. uncomfortable things, inconvenient truths, and those sorts of things. And fake news is a get out of thinking free card for every aspect of life. I wish okay. I had. Exactly, I, you know, it's all fake. This is fake news, you're on fake news. You don't even have to listen to me. You can just talk about whatever you want. The pandemic response continues in that way that the government really doesn't seem to be doing anything and like a thousand people die per day. Is that a failure though? Not necessarily. Here, take a look at Jared Kushner. We have more than 170,000 Americans are now dead from this pandemic over the past five or six months. Are 170,000 dead Americans, would you still report, suggest that this has been a success story? Yes, look, uh, there was a lot of challenges. This has been a, a global pandemic, a lot of unprecedented challenges. Again, the first phase of it, uh, people didn't know what to expect. A lot of it was happening in different states. The president was able to rush the supplies that we needed. Uh, now we're in the middle phase where we're, we're using uh, all the knowledge we have right now to deal with strategically. Uh, how do we uh, learn from what we had and protect the vulnerable? Okay, so 170,000 dead, it is a success. And he said, the only issue is that early on, we didn't know what to expect. You know, We were just blindsided by this, which is completely not true. Yes, there's stuff about the virus that we didn't know, but we had a pretty good idea of what might be necessary to stop its spread. You know, Like people having PPE and things like that. The, the mistakes that were made in the first few months can't just be washed away by saying, hey, what are you gonna do? It was new. Yeah, it's, you know, there's a grocery store chain here in Texas called HEB, right? Oh, I know HEB had the best coronavirus response that I'd seen, and so grateful for HEB. I can't even tell you, you know, like they single-handedly helped us through this entire pandemic, and they started planning for this when the when the virus was still over in China. Hmm. So if HEB knows about coronavirus enough to have the foresight to plan ahead, right? I mean, they stocked up and they were, you know, extending their hours, all kinds of things that they were doing. How did our federal government miss it? You know, like yeah. we all knew what was happening. We saw it happening across Asia and then across Europe. It just doesn't make any sense. I don't know what else he would have said though. I don't I don't expect Jared Kushner to come out and be like, yeah, we kind of screwed it all up. You know, <laughs> like <laughs> there were things we, we should have done better. But he's not gonna say that, unfortunately. But in not saying that, he's excusing himself and he's giving uh, his supporters a reason to say, oh, it's not that bad. When the reality is, I, I, you posted on Twitter that our hometown has a smaller population than the amount of people who have died now from coronavirus, which is insane. And what's yeah. funny about that is our hometown is actually the biggest city in Connecticut. So it's, it's like it's a major city, major for Connecticut. But it's a major city and more people than that entire population have died from coronavirus. And that was a big wake up call for me. 
And then even you know the town that I'm in right now has an even smaller population. I'm in a suburb. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, no, it's it's devastating. And of course, he's not going to admit that, which is why we have to play his comments and make sure that people get the correct information. Yeah, 170,000 people have died. And yes, it is a global pandemic, as Jared Kushner said. But we can also acknowledge that America has failed in its response, the worst out of any country. And honestly, with the exception of like Brazil and Russia recently, over the past few months, we have almost singularly failed. And so you don't get to say that it's this constant across the world, this global pandemic. No, I want to talk about the variables. What is it about America that has caused us to fail? And part of it is choices. And let's let's just briefly update people on one of the sets of choices that have been pushed by the administration over the past two months or so. And that is, um, we gotta have the sports, we've talked about that. But we also gotta go back to schools and kids don't even get it. And they're not gonna die and they don't really spread it, so don't worry about it. Well, maybe we should worry because Mississippi public schools have confirmed 199 cases among students and 245 among teachers. School districts have ordered over 2,000 students and almost 600 teachers to quarantine for two weeks. Schools in 71 of Mississippi's 82 counties have reported cases. Uh, the Daily Tar Heel reported that UNC Chapel Hill announces that it's gonna transition all of its classes to fully online instruction. Why? Maybe because the university's COVID-19 positivity rate rose from 2.8% to 13.6% last week. And so all of these schools have come back in a session very recently. It has taken virtually no time for it to spread throughout colleges, high schools, and elementary schools as well. These are the sorts of choices that we keep getting wrong that cause us to have failed worse than any other country when it comes to the response to this pandemic. I think what is the most baffling part of all of this is who is in charge? You know, who are these governors? I mean, I live in Texas, so I can talk to you about bad governors and all their bad faith decisions that they make and the rest of us have to live with. But I always wonder what are people's expectations? What did you think was going to happen? And what was your plan? Did you have any kind of contingency plan? Did you have any kind of um, just insight, what kind of precautions were you taking? And unfortunately, a lot of them, whenever you do hear about them, they're not enough. You know, you have mm-hmm. elementary school children going to school and trading masks with one, another, with one another because they don't know. They don't know you're not supposed to trade these things. And I mean, what are you supposed to do? I mean, throughout this whole thing, one of my biggest successes was not having a child, you know, and having to deal with that. On top of you know all the things that parents deal with these days with homeschooling and now sending their kids back to school, it's so much. It's too much. Yeah, and it, it is. And what was that? It was all preventable. That's the worst part of it is we didn't have to be here where we are this bad at this point. There were so many things that could have been done that should have been done up to this point that would have put us in a much better position than we're in now. But unfortunately, I think a big part of why America, the United States specifically, is struggling with this so bad is it's just a culture thing. Yeah, no, totally. Um, we we could have had you know twenty thousand dead it would have been devastating. Would have been worse than swine flu, let alone Ebola or anything like that. But it it could have been could have been a hell of a lot better. It could have been you know one Bridgeport, Connecticut, better in terms of the death toll. Mm-hmm. But we have gotten lots of things wrong, and we will continue to. I don't know about Houston, but I walk around and see the vast majority of people still not wearing masks. Mm-hmm. Um, and we have, you know, our top elected officials are still wishy-washy at best on it. Trump isn't telling people they need to wear masks and they need to socially distance and all of that. Um, and now I read a, a headline earlier today: America's alt-right is fueling Europe's anti-mask protests. Yeah. Europeans, yeah, they're sharing coronavirus conspiracy theories and photos of U.S. protests to plan their own. So not only have we ruined our response, but we're doing our best to make sure that Europe gets messed up as well. Well, you know what's so funny about that to me is up to this point, a lot of the conspiracy theories that have come out about coronavirus were very, um, they would kind of fall apart as soon as you say, well, what about the rest of the world? This is not just an American problem. This is not just a thing that the US government is doing. And they're like, oh, all the other world governments are in cahoots with us. And I was like, that seems like a stretch. <laughs> you know, like, I don't know how you would prove that or assert that even. So it is interesting. I am curious to see what these Europeans actually believe and think and how they're distinguishing it, especially since they've been dealing with it for so much longer than we have. Yeah, and by the way, here's one prediction um, that I'm definitely gonna make. If they're successful, if the alt-right creates these you know, no mask, no distance protests, and they start putting pressure on their governments to not require people to take these minor precautions. 
Yeah. It will result in numbers going up. And mm -hmm. that will be used by Trump and his administration to say, hey, look, we're not the only ones who are failing. We already we already know. He he recently he announced that New Zealand's numbers are spiking. Do you know what they spiked to on the date he was talking about? What? Nine cases. Oh my god, yeah. But the percentage yeah. exploded. Think about the percentages, Yasmin. And so if it happens in France and Germany, and because of us, mm -hmm. they're gonna claim that that's a justification for the response we've had and how it's not that bit big of, a, of an issue. Because look, other countries are having it bad too, and it's gonna happen. It really emboldens the conspiracy theorists, but it, it's more strange to me how aligned Trump is with the conspiracy theorists and how he is focused on getting them on, well, because they think that he's the savior. He think they think that all the bad things in the world, Trump is going to fix them. He isn't the bad thing, he's gonna fix the bad thing. So I don't blame him, I guess, for pandering. It seems right up his alley. Yeah, it does. Just a couple of years ago, Donald Trump supported recognizing Jerusalem as the capital of Israel rather than Tel Aviv, which previous administrations had done. Now he gave reasons at the time for why he did that. But yesterday, speaking about the decision, the reasons were a little bit different. Take a look. And we moved the capital of Israel to Jerusalem. That's for the evangelicals. You know, it's amazing with that. The evangelicals are more excited about that than Jewish people. It's really, right? It's incredible. It is incredible. It's incredible that he said that because obviously that's why. If you know anything about evangelical Christianity, their beliefs about the end times and, you know, the millennialism and, and all of that. This is a thing that they have wanted, but past Republicans and even Trump at the time had explained it as being what's best for Israel and America and the Palestinians somehow, despite you know what all the people in the area would say. He said that was the reason. Now he's acknowledging no, it's it's because of you know American evangelicals that he made this potentially dangerous choice. Yeah, and you know, we kind of mentioned earlier that this is kind of in my wheelhouse as far as the kind of videos that I do. But I have actually been hesitant to do a video on Israel and Palestine for a long time because, first of all, it's so complex. There's so many layers to it, but also people get really, really passionate about it to the point where it almost doesn't make sense to me. You know, I remember in ninth grade, world geography, we had a mock trial, Palestine versus Israel. I don't know, it, was, it seems very progressive for a ninth grade <laughs> in public school, but we did it and I mean, within maybe 10 minutes of this mock trial happening and we had been preparing for it for a week for a week at that point both sides it just everything just fell apart you know somebody the israel side called jesus up to the stand and that was it we were just like how do we what is where do we go from here but the thing with this particular you know peace deal if you want to call it that first of all they keep talking about peace in the middle east as if that's a, even a thing it's not they make it sound like there's a bunch of arab people sitting on a peninsula fighting with one another. But they're forgetting to mention that there's so many other powers working there. And that's why it's so unstable. There's the US, there's Russia, there's China, there's the UK, the UN, the EU. Then there's all the oil and gas companies that are over there. Then there's all these like smaller rebel groups that don't necessarily work in compliance or allegiance with the countries that they're living within, right? So there's so many things going on in this one region. And then on top of that, there's a history of how we got to this point, which is also very, very complex. But um, I was watching an interview with a professor over at Johns Hopkins, and he's an expert on all this, and he made a really, really good point. Um, what he said was that Donald Trump hasn't really had a successful foreign policy win. You know, he's had a lot of near wins, a lot of things that sounded good, but didn't actually do a whole lot. You know, North Korea, we haven't really heard a whole lot since the last time we heard about that, which feels like, you know, 15 years ago. But he needed a win. And this feels and sounds like a win, even though it really probably won't change very much from what's already happening over there. The UAE was always kind of friendly with Israel and Saudi Arabia. And if you know, Saudi Arabia is allied with the US and they're in opposition to Iran. So there's so many different things going on. It's not the win that they want it to be or they're trying to make it sound like it is. 
Um, but it is going to be favorable with those evangelicals. And yeah. he, needs that, he needs that vote. Uh, I think you're right, he does need a, a perceived win. And um, you're also right that it's complicated. So many different groups and factions involved in this, which is why, is why I think it's probably most responsible to just let you know, American evangelicals decide what our decisions will be made in the Middle East. But and anyway, I want to give people a few details about the deals. Um, the US, Israel, and the UAE put out a joint statement outlining how the two Middle Eastern nations will develop ties in numerous areas, including investment, security, tourism, technology, and energy. And will establish formal embassies in each other's countries. Israel will, quote, suspend declaring sovereignty over parts of the West Bank that it had previously expressed interest to annex. In exchange, the UAE will treat Israel as it would any other country it has friendly relations with, making it only the third Arab country to have such open relations with Jerusalem. Now, for the most part, the bounds of the deal sound okay. The the question will be how much they will actually be followed because Israel has made any number of promises about not taking territory that they've then gone back on. So the question will be, will they be more likely to follow the bounds of a deal with the UAE than they have been with previous agreements with the United States? Tune in to see, but, yeah. but we, we do have to just briefly acknowledge that some of the talk about the deal has seemed a little bit odd, including this quote from Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, which had been posted and then taken down for reasons that will become obvious when he said, the deal connects the UAE with Israel. Both of them are advanced democracies and their societies are advanced. UAE might be advanced, it's not an advanced democracy. It's a hereditary monarchy where political freedoms are very limited. And I get that you're gonna say nice things about the country you just made a deal with, but they don't suddenly become a representative democracy because you have enhanced trade relations with them. That's not how it actually works. I mean, even Israel is arguable as far as their democratic policies and the way that they function. And it, it is important to, to note that, well, you mentioned it earlier, just because Israel, like the, the shining beacon of all of this seems to be that Israel will not illegally annex parts of Palestine into their country. It was already illegal, you know, like yeah. you're not supposed to do this in the first place. And they've been doing it. They've been having all these illegal settlements in Palestine. The Palestinians cannot fight back. And it's just like, why would we believe you? <laughs> you know, just because you you said it this time, it's like, well, you're going to anyway. So yeah. it's just a matter of time. You know, we have a comment from um, Hanan Ashrawi, Ashrawi, a member of the executive committee of the Palestine Liberation Organization that, that had similar uh, elements to what you were saying, saying Israel got rewarded for not declaring openly what it's been doing to Palestine illegally and persistently since the beginning of this occupation. The UAE has come out in the open on its secret dealings and normalization with Israel. Please don't do us a favor, we are nobody's fig leaf. Yeah. And so. Yeah, I, I I would imagine I haven't watched a ton of you know American cable news analysis of this deal, but I would imagine the concerns and fears of Palestinians are probably not being put front and center uh, when it comes to what this deal is going to do to the status quo uh, there. Let alone what America's contribution to that situation has been, including in things like earlier when we were talking about uh, moving uh, the recognizing the capital being Jerusalem. Yeah, I mean, Americans really, the minute that you speak out in a pro-Palestine way, no matter how objectively you try to look at the situation, it's never received well. Which is, like I think I said earlier, I never really understood it fully, aside from just Semitism and just general being pro-Israel or anti-Israel or whatever. But it's not about being pro or anti any of it. It's about what the law is, you know? It's what parameters were put in place and these are the parameters that are not being abided against and that's it, you know? You were told not to do this, you agreed to it and then you did it anyway. So why is it a problem to say you shouldn't have done that? So here on The Damage Report, I try to do my best to make sure that the information I provide, especially regarding politics and what's going on in America and around the world is as accurate as I could possibly make it. But I acknowledge openly, it's not hidden, that I approach politics from a leftist point of view. So bear in mind that that bias potentially exists. But if you're looking for accurate information, we're not the only source for it. There are others who attempt to make sure that as many Americans as possible know true, verified, accurate information about the election. Um, one source for that is Politiscope. And we are very lucky to be joined uh, once again on the show by the co-founder and editor in chief of Politiscope, Jackson White. Yo, Welcome yo, what's going Report. on everybody? How's it going? It's, it's good to see you, it's been a bit. I don't think we've spoken since the, be the beginning of the pandemic. 
Yeah, I think it was uh, last time I was on was in February, and I was actually uh, out there in California uh, for the mm-hmm. main show. But you know, like you said, everything just kind of went down the drain, and we everybody's been in the same boat. So yeah, you know, I'm out here in New Jersey. You know, we're both in hard hit areas, and I'm just doing my best to keep pushing forward and keep the faith alive. So that's where I'm at. Uh, good, good to hear that you've uh, that you've weathered it well. Um, so we're going to be talking about. Uh, Politoscope about misinformation about the election. Um, for people who might not be familiar with the app, could you give people a basic idea of what it's uh, intended to accomplish? Yeah, so and you know, in a nutshell, Politoscope is just an easier way to um, keep up with politics generally. And really, what we do is we aim to provide nonpartisan information by allowing people to keep up with policy. You know, there's a lot of stories that go around. Um, you know, especially in mainstream media, a lot of that really is just uh, opinion hosts. Who are either very, very pro Republican, like Fox News, or maybe you have like your MSNBC, who just really, really vouch for the corporate Democrats. Mm -hmm. And so, what Politoscope aims to do is cut through the middle of that and focus on policy so that people can know exactly what's going on and really focus on the data. And also, you can follow campaigns on Politoscope, you can donate to any candidate of your choice if they're running for the House or the Senate. You can see who's in office what they voted for and against with brief comprehensive breakdowns of legislation that's been in Congress for anybody who's in office, register to vote. So pretty much just general political engagement. We really Mm -hmm. aim to make that just more accessible and more attractive and really just more modern You know, for how millennials and Gen Z keep up with information today. You know, it's it's been interesting that throughout 2020, which has been just the worst, we have so many big things that are happening that that I, I automatically want to know how it's impacted um, what's going to be going on with Politoscope and how you approach these things. We have the pandemic, which is this huge thing that people are having to think about every day. And in fact, a lot of them have had to stay home. So they've had a lot of time to be thinking about politics and, and looking for information. You've got the protests that have been going on, which you know there's been there's been a lot of attempts to define what those are about by different ends of the political spectrum. Um, and you also have the background of first the primaries, but now the elections. So what's it been like at Politoscope with so many of these massive things and potentially a user base of people who have even more time than usual to be using something like Politoscope? Well, we've definitely seen our daily usage go up. Um, you know, we've uh, we're a couple years in, so you know, we haven't been around for a very long time, but we've definitely seen our engagement go up and you know, one thing, you know, like how you said, with um, you know the elections coming up, what's going on with the post office and people's concerns about mail-in voting. Really, what our approach has been is to help people um, really, really connect to the voting process. You know, really, really connect to what they're voting for, who they're voting for, and focus mostly on how we can make that easy. Because there's a lot of jargon on both sides about what you can and can't do. So, you know, simply put, we just want to make it easier. So, you know, what you know, when Bernie Sanders was running, when uh, you know, Pete Buttigieg and everybody was still in the race and everything <laughs> like that, you know, that 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 got that kind of ended. But um, you know, really, really just focusing on well, what's he running for. And mm-hmm. um, you know, so but um, you know, I think that in times like these for you know uh Politoscope, TYT, and anybody in politics. I think that now is really, really important for us to, you know, double down and really give more and and really, really focus on what matters. So, yeah. you know, simply put, um, our usership has gone up, our daily active usage has gone up, and we're just aiming to help people know how they can stay safe, um, how they can mail in, what the rules in all uh, 50 states are, because there's different rules for when you can send ballots in, if you can make excuses for why you're sending a ballot in. And so every day, you know, as a chief editor, what I really aim to do is just allow people to know how they can safely vote because there's a lot of worry, you know, and especially older people because those are the people who vote the most. There's a lot of worry mm-hmm. about, you know, COVID. So, you know, we really want people to tap into the information that's already out there. You know, I, I think that that might be one of the most important things that you can do, especially considering that, as as you say. The situation for requesting a mail-in ballot is very different from state to state. What excuses are allowed, what the dates are. Mm -hmm. And there's so much attempted misinformation about the entire process. that It seems like one of the most important possible things going on right now is making sure that people know all of the rules for being able to vote. So thank you for, for focusing on that. It seems pretty important. Yeah. Considering how important this election is, yeah, and and nobody really could have nobody saw this coming. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. I mean, what 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 a what a crazy year 2020 has been. 
You know what I'm saying? Like literally from the very beginning of it. Uh, it, it's just been, it's just really been a crazy roller coaster. So, and I think one of the um, things that I've really been grateful for is, you know, just being able to know that, okay, we're really making a difference. You know, we're really doing something important. Um, and you know, I'm glad that we started a few years ago so that we could, you know, kind of set our infrastructure, get our foundation, and um, you know, it's yeah. it, it's it's just really been a great ride. So let me ask you a question. Like, if I and correct me if I miss if I misinterpret this, but the the sort of approach to politics and following politics day to day that you're talking about is people focusing on policy and having a good idea of what politicians are actually trying to accomplish and what they're not, and making sure that their views of politics are informed by an accurate set of facts about what's happening. So if that's a potential world that we could reach. In your estimation, as you've been on this this um, like adventure to try to get us to that place, how far are we from that? And uh, are we moving in the right or the wrong direction? And what areas of misinformation bother you mo- like most, especially during 2020? What sorts of misinformation stand out to you as particularly dangerous? Well, interestingly enough, I think that you know America is a very interesting country in that everything's up for debate here. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Uh-huh. Like. If the sky is blue, I don't really agree with that. So let me let, 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 let me let me change it up. And that's kind of the kind of country that we live in. You know, a lot of people think COVID's fake. A lot of people don't want to wear masks. A lot of people, you know, a lot of propaganda going around about the post office losing money. And I think that at the same time, while access to information in the age we live in has made it easier for people to stay up to date with facts, it's also made it easier for people to just get in echo chambers where all they hear is what they want to hear. So I don't really think I can confidently say that we're just headed in the right direction as a whole. I actually think that things are becoming more divided. I think that the partisanship in both parties is growing. Um, You know, you see the Republican and the Democratic parties fighting within themselves. You know, you have the progressive wing and the Democratic party and the corporate wing. And then in the Republican party, you kind of have the libertarian wing. And then, you know, just your everyday run of the mill corporate wing. So um, I think that I think that we have a really, really tough fight ahead of us. And one of the biggest challenges that I've come to find again is, you know, if people don't want to believe something, they just won't believe it. You know, and, and in America, we treat politics like a basketball game or a football game. It's a team sport. Yeah. And um, I think that that's really reflective of decades of corporate corruption. And how that's affected our education system, how that has tampered our abilities to know how to think and really, really, you know, uh, just be objective with finding the truth rather than finding what makes us feel good. But at the same time, I do think that um, what we're seeing is more activism, you know, more than ever. I think that um, younger people are, you know, running for office. I think that there's more emphasis on local government that we've been seeing growing. Um, And I think that that's really important right now because I think that in America, when we think about politics and we think about voting and we think about how we can participate in the process, we typically think about every four years, who's gonna be the president. But in reality, so much of what impacts our daily lives happens on a local level. You know, how, you know um, the state of our schools, how the public schools are, programs. I'm from St. Louis, Missouri, for instance, there's a program um, for any student, uh, once they start kindergarten, if they're in a public school, they're able to open up a savings account, uh, a college savings account throughout their time in grade school and through high school. Studies mm-hmm. have shown that if you have at least five hundred dollars uh, of savings, you're more likely to not just go to college but finish college. And all of that happens on a local level. You know, really good ideas about how we can fund things, how we can make programs. A lot of that happens right around the corner from us. And we really don't have access to that because on television, all we see is, you know, Tucker Carlson and, you know, different people who are focused Mm -hmm. on, you know, cultural issues and, you know, Donald Trump, Nancy Pelosi, AOC, all the people, you know, the big famous people that everyone knows. But there's just so much more going on. And I think that um, what we really, really need to do is uh, bite down and focus on local government. Mm-hmm. In my opinion, that's even more important than the federal government because, again, it, you know, there's just so much of what affects your everyday life happens uh, in local government. Yeah, 
Yeah, no, I think that you're totally right. And it's one of the things that we've stressed for we, with the close of the Democratic primary, there were a lot of you know Bernie Sanders supporters who felt really like off put by the result and all of that. And we try to mm-hmm. remind them that, you know, regardless of what you end up thinking about the, the presidential election, there are so many other levels of government that demand yeah. your involvement, activism, and, and all of that. The so it's not um, over. Exactly, it never yeah. can be, unfortunately. Yep. It's exhausting, like 2020. Mm-hmm. So um, if somebody's watching this and they, they want to, to take a look at the app, um, where, can they, where can they find out about it? You can, uh, da- it's available on iOS and Android, just type in Politiscope. And again, really, you know, what we aim to do is just make general political engagement easier. If you need to know what the news is, you know, whatever the news of the day is, we have it and we source from reputable sources. And um, all of our data comes from places like you know the FEC for like you know campaign election mm-hmm. information, uh, the Department of Labor for things like um, job updates, the the state of the job market, you know sources like that um, that you can trust. You're not necessarily trusting what Politiscope thinks and what the people behind Politiscope think, but everything that we have on the app is from credible sources. Yeah. So you know, again, just daily news consumption. If you want to see who's running and what state, how much money they've raised, what they're polling at. You know, again, just the, the quick information that you really need to know, that's what Politiscope aims to provide. So just type in Politiscope on Android or Apple devices, and we're there. We run seven days a week. We miss no days. We send out updates, and it's just an easier way to keep up with politics. That's awesome. Yeah, and now especially we need more of that, so I appreciate that. Mm-hmm. And Jackson, it's uh, great to catch up with you. Um, let's definitely keep talking as the, the campaign uh, continues. Uh, very oh, yeah, interested to see how things develop. Definitely, absolutely. It's, it's it's about to get pretty crazy, so everybody buckle up and please register to vote. You mm-hmm. know, what, what whatever it is that you believe, please register to vote because if we don't participate, our ability to participate will only diminish. You yeah. know, that's the nature of power. So we got to fight. That's that's the direction it's moving. Jackson <laughs> White, thank you so much. All right, appreciate it. If you know anything about me and what I bring to this channel, you know that one of the areas that I have been most distraught about the damage being done over the past few years is the damage being done to environmental regulations as climate change and other environmental disasters proceed at a terrible pace year by year. But you also know that hypothetically, depending on how the election goes, perhaps there is room for a little bit of positive change in that area. And uh, to speak about all this and more, very excited to welcome to the show the North American Director for 350.org, Tamara Tolzo Lachlan. Welcome to the Damage Report. Hi, thanks so much for having me. It is nice to have something good to talk about. <laughs> it is, it is. And so hopefully we're going to find a few of those things. So um, before we launch into some of you know looking forward to the next months and years, for people who might not be familiar with, um, with your organization, um, can you tell them what, what it's all about? Yeah, so 350.org is a global climate organization focused on three things, ending fossil fuels. And the ways that we're doing it constitute the other things that we spend our time doing. So we're interested in making sure not another penny goes to keep the fossil fuel economy going. And that we raise up the voices of those that are most impacted in trying to get this work done. So most recently, we have spent a lot of time translating the other climate people that black, indigenous and people of color are in fact climate people as well. So beyond making it really hard to do dirty, oily business and telling climate people to not be racist, we have our hands full. Uh, that that either of those seems like a full time <laughs> job. Um, yeah. So tell me tell me a little bit about that progress because um, that sort of criticism that the sorts of voices in climate activism that tend to be raised up tend to look pretty similar. Do you think that there's been much progress over the past few years on that that front? So I do, we're in the middle of the 15th anniversary of Katrina. And it feels like it's not an odd time to raise that that was the first time we called the question, if you care about this stuff, how could you let this happen? So um, that was the first reminder that folks who've been in this work when it was um, environmental work, when it was environmental justice work, when it was zoning and air quality and all the things that we like to do to separate it out in the silos, we weren't talking about people and planet. And the reason we weren't doing it is because it's easy to separate uh, the protection of a specific species or sage grouse or grass even than to try to deal with the stuff we designed to make uh, this work exclusive. And so Katrina raised the alarm, unfortunately, for a lot of people and then Flint happened and all the water people felt like 
wow, we this is what we do. Like protecting people from poison water is an entire specialty in environmental work. And here we let this happen, not somewhere else, not where we could say there's a lot of political cover for it, but right in our own backyard. And so second bell went off and climate people started to get the point that like these conversations we're having about moving the needle for climate are deeply tied to the stuff we built that makes it harder to do the work. So if you exclude all the people who were harmed, then you probably can't invite them to a conversation about change. If the future of um, even even park space involves having people in it, you should probably have some brown or black people in that conversation because in 2040, everyone will be one of them. So (laughs) it's pretty tough to, um, to, to keep skirting around it. And it feels like we're in a moment where People of color are moving into the places where strategy happens. So not just important visual moments, crying on cue, all the stuff that we used to do when everybody's tagline was save this bear, save this tree, don't touch that grass, murder all these people. So now that we've swift, we sort of switched our tactics into focusing on the fact that no amount, no room of bears, no matter how virtuous, will ever sit around in a room trying to figure out how to save us from climate. So potentially this is a good place to spend our energy. Yeah. You know, you mentioned it was 15 years ago, and it really, man, it does. It doesn't feel like it was 15 years ago. I still remember exactly where I was when I was watching the the initial footage and hearing, you know, the impassioned um, phone call. I believe from the mayor at that point. So that was 15 years ago. Just a few years ago, I think three years ago, we had hurricanes very close to together hit Puerto Rico and Texas. And we had very different responses to those two things. So when when you experience that years after Katrina, years in which we should have learned, um, when you see that, do, do you have any hope that while Donald Trump is president, that if the same thing were to happen, that we would respond to it in any different way than we did a few years ago? Wow, I feel like we as human beings might respond to it. I don't know. I don't know if the if the guy who lives in public housing at 1600 Pennsylvania <laughs> Avenue would in fact respond any differently. Mostly because he's expended all the folks who we put on that job. So uh, under his leadership, FEMA is so overextended that they couldn't respond to a broken window and a cat in a tree at the same time because they have been put out <laughs> to do work that could have been stopped by any amount of planning. So FEMA, who did not the greatest job in any of those spaces, isn't even fully equipped to respond in fire and flood season. I mean, we're in the middle of that moment now. Fires are raging as people are being flooded. Puerto Rico is the best case, the most well known case. The US Virgin Islands of St. Croix, St. Thomas, and St. John, which are 20 minutes away, have no hope of being seen in this world because it's full of black and brown people who have even less access to voting power in the way that Puerto Rico does. So it definitely isn't a race for how we can. Uh, measure who's suffering, but we are in a moment where even with the best intentions, we do not have the infrastructure to respond to all of these things happening in at once, and that is a failure of government. Yeah, you know, um, so starting to look to the future, uh, yeah. we we don't know exactly how November is going to go, um, <laughs> or even if you know we'll really have an election, but we do have <laughs> nominees now. So we've got Biden and we've got yeah. um, Kamala Harris. You know, out of out of the potential choices, you've had a fairly wide range of environmental policies and platforms <laughs> represented in this primary. Um, how would you rate how this whole thing ended with those two as our nominees? Oh gosh, uh, so I, I would say that it has been a tight race for climate. Which isn't the thing we could have predicted. Um, in this election, the power of the movement really got in everyone's faces from um, lobbying and bird dog in the DNC to making sure individual plans coming out of it, to making sure that every single candidate had something to say about what they were going to do on climate, the veracity of those plans, how strong they are, who they help, whether they happen in a reality that we could get anywhere close to is like another set of questions. But in a moment where people at least have to have a stance on climate, it moves it up in the conversation to somewhere closer to being able to mobilize the kind of numbers we would need to see real action that prevents us all from dying on a fiery gas ball. So I would say that all things being equal, the race actually showed up as a great place to wait a conversation. And that was without the climate debate that we needed. That horrifying multi day, yeah. everybody had a something to say, but never together thing that got done instead was useful for laying out platforms. And for the folks that were ready, they were able to really advance the conversation and put us in a moment where even in all of the cluster that is the Democratic National Committee, we can have a conversation about good platforms versus okay and solid platforms. Yeah, 
By the way, I think the tagline for this year is going to be dying on a fiery gas ball. And yeah. so, um, you know, so <laughs> look, let, let's say hypothetically, hypothetically, Trump is defeated, and even more hypothetically, he allows that to happen. And he goes away, and we've got the the you know new White House, and it's Biden, and it's Kamala Harris. And so um, I, I don't think many environmental activists think, okay, the work is done, we're good now, we don't have to do anything. But let's say you know there's you know a war on all fronts, put pressure on them to do what's necessary. What are some of your expectations for what can be accomplished in the next few years? Sure, quite a bit. Uh, being in the climate decade means we're really clear that. In 10 years time, in 2030, we need to have done a bunch of things. So in dinosaur time, which government usually works in, that means we had to have installed a government that will recognize this and start to build the infrastructure. So the Green New Deal, as sexy as people it is, and as much as people wanna fight about it, is jobs, infrastructure, and human health. Guess what, we're gonna pay for all that stuff anyway, because the bridges are crumbling, people are sick, and nobody has a job, look out the window. So it feels like given that people <laughs> even fighting that title, we still have to pay for that work. So on day one, the executive can get in and send a signal that we are no longer going to continue funneling our money into coal, oil, and gas. The petrol dollar has to die in order for the rest of us to live. And so who can send a signal better than that than the executive? That means no more fossil fuel drilling on public lands, no more new leases, which is currently politically un, un, um, uh, third rail. But guess what? Uh, the, the train ain't running, so we might as well talk about it. Uh, they could also signal to every single agency that has been retooled and turned into a chop shop for democracy that they can start working on this stuff, develop their own procurement plan so they're not buying into the fossil fuel company, um, uh, lining their pockets by buying into the way that they work and make sure every one of them has a mandate that is focusing on how we can reduce our emissions in real time. And all of that on beyond like calling a special session, which we would be my dream, is like calling a special session around what the heck are we gonna do on climate? And how do we mobilize everything that we have left in the government to get us to the place where we can argue later? Yeah, yeah. there's like a million things that I wanna say based on that. <laughs> but um. Yeah, you know, it, I don't know if maybe this fits into what you were saying about the chop shop, but I saw when they announced that the the methane regulations were going to be rolled back a couple of weeks ago, the EPA put out a statement saying that industries were being choked by the regulations, and I thought, wait, isn't that what the industries are supposed to say? You're the EPA. Yeah, <laughs> it's not yeah, your job. Well, it used to be the EPA. A lot of really amazing people fled, and trust me, yeah. I had a whole list of things the EPA wasn't doing when it was working that I would have been yeah. uncomfortable about. But relative to all of that, turning a bunch of people who are scientists, who understand data, who listen to people, who connect information, who don't make their decisions based on how it will affect their friends, but how it will affect the outcomes that they hope for. Methane is on the table because we failed to deal with it when we could have. So that's the other sad thing is that states have failed to regulate. I'm calling from Maryland, which has really done a vanguard job of failing to regulate on methane between communities coming together to raise it. Uh, folks mentioning that is pipeline leaking all over the place. That's all they do is leak fuel and leak air, leak gasoline and vapor. So if we knew this was coming, if in a moment where we're worried about emissions, and methane is the container that allows them to stay in the air long enough to cause all of our problems. We saw this coming five years ago. We could have done something about it three years ago. It continuing to be a problem is as much our problem in climate as it is not getting fossil fuels footprints out of this work. That way we could just do the work of democracy, yeah, yeah. which is making the best decisions for the largest number of people. So I, I, wish, I wish that we could talk for like the next two hours, um, but, I, but I'm gonna have to limit myself. So one last question, and this is something that I've started to worry about. So we've had the past couple of years where seemingly to a level that I haven't seen since like an inconvenient truth came out, like front and center conversation about climate change is happening pretty regularly. And, and I credit that to you know groups like the Sunrise Movement and AOC and others. And um, so that's been great. During the pandemic, talk about climate change has receded quite a bit, seemingly. Um, but what has happened is we've had an experiment as a country where the question is, how much are we going to band together to mm -hmm. stop an emergency? And in comparison to virtually every other country in the world, we have done a horrible job. And so as you've seen that, does that inform your views of what the American people will accept in terms of what needs to be done to stop the next emergency, the climate emergency? No, I actually think we've seen more climate people in the streets than you can imagine. 
Um, because most of us are progressives, because most of us are people who just don't want to see other people die needlessly and aimlessly. I would say that uh, KXL, no dapple really sparked the flames. Mm. It made people remember that civil unrest doesn't just happen in history and beautiful glossy photographs in the museum. And so people started recognizing that you could get right into the street and that you don't need an invitation. All of that work seeded the movement for black lives and a real support for climate folks stepping in to be able to be supportive. I mean, heck, witches and everybody else have been involved in getting into this conversation around <laughs> how do we show up for people. So I would say that I think the baton is being passed from issue to issue, which actually gives me hope that enough of us are running in the right direction so that we can push the decision makers. Leaders know what they're doing. People all over the place are really clear on what's happening. It's decision makers that we need to push and nothing motivates them like a mobilization. So it mm. is actually heartening to me to see that having a conversation about divesting from fossil fuels lines up so nicely with defunding the police that we might actually move money in the stuff that matters to people. So, so I am in fact seeing a trend that suggests that suppression of people is ramping up, but so are people willing to get into the streets. So it used to be a conversation about why the youth weren't involved. Now the youth are deeply involved and the multi-generational group of people who was always there yelling that this was important are there to support them because wisdom needs energy and energy needs wisdom. So I'm feeling pretty good, not because it's all going well, but because for once as a black woman, I'm not in this ditch alone. Wow, okay, um, it's given me a lot to think about. Okay, interesting, <laughs> and, and a semi positive note considering how horrible yeah. this entire year has been. Oh man, oh man, it's been so bad that uh, I have nothing to say about it. Yeah, okay, <laughs> I, th I think everybody knows knows what we're thinking. Um, uh, tomorrow, that it's just been great to have you on. Thank you so much for joining oh, us, and oh. very excited to see what um, what you and and 350.org and all the other organizations are, are capable of over the next few years. Yeah, hope to see you in the streets. It's gonna be, it's gonna take all of us. Thank you. Thanks for listening to the full episode of The Damage Report. Support our work, listen ad-free, access members-only bonus content, and more by subscribing to Apple Podcasts at apple.co slash TYT. I'm your host, John Adarola. I'll see you soon.